Welcome back to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and this is part two of a series of episodes about how to engage people who have harmed you. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to get episodes as soon as they are released and support the podcast financially, please remember to go to my website, get the Place We Find Ourselves app, and sign up. It's $30 per year or $3 a month. New episodes release immediately to the app, and that's four weeks before they are available on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else. So if you want to get episodes immediately, you've got to go to my website and sign up for $30 per year. Please consider doing this because your financial support keeps the podcast going. Okay, in the last episode, I explained that there are at least three kinds of people in the world. There are normal everyday sinners, wicked people, and evil people. And I suggested that you have to engage each of these categories of people differently. The fundamental attribute that distinguishes normal sinners from from wicked people is that wicked people refuse to suffer the experience of guilt. They refuse to feel the feeling of guilt. The issue is, when you say to a person, ouch, you hurt me, does that person look at their heart and say, oh my gosh, what have I done? How have I harmed this person? The primary attribute of wicked people is that they refuse to examine their heart and say, what have I done? What I want to do today, or at least begin with, is uh, identify two more attributes that tend to characterize wicked people. The first is that wicked people are often highly skilled at scapegoating. If you confront a wicked person about their sin or their failure, instead of examining their heart and feeling sorrow and guilt for how they have hurt you, a wicked person will somehow shift the blame onto your failure and your sin. They will somehow shift the blame, the spotlight, away from their own heart, away from their own failure, and onto yours, onto your sin, accusing you of doing something wrong. Now, this practice is called scapegoating. The term scapegoat refers to a Jewish ritual in which the priest would symbolically lay the sins of the people upon the head of a goat and then send that goat away from the community. Scapegoating is about projecting your own sin and failure onto another person and then punishing that other person for it. The goal of all scapegoating is to separate the scapegoated person from the family, from the church, from the business, from the community, from whatever organization you are a part of. The wicked person wants you to be cast out, to be excluded, and to be cast out because you are labeled as the cause of the problem. Some of you have been either literally or functionally cast out from your family because you have been labeled as the problem, the bad one. Now, wicked people will often accuse you of the very sins and failures that they, deep down, most despise in themselves. Example, suppose a son says to his father, son goes to his father and says, Dad, growing up I felt like you never wanted to be with me or spend time with me. You were always either at work or you were playing golf or you were working on your car. That's what the son says to the father. And the father responds, son, I'm sorry you feel that way, but it felt like you never wanted to be with us. You always kept your mother and I at arm's length. You kept us out. You would spend all your time in your room playing guitar. 
Do you see the brilliant wickedness of the father's response to his son? The father is accusing his son of the very thing his son has just accused him of. In other words, the father has successfully scapegoated his son. The father has taken his sin and failure, namely neglecting his son, and he has placed that sin on the son's head. It's not dad who is guilty of anything. It's the son's fault. The son kept mom and dad out. The son spent all his time playing guitar in his room. It's not that dad was neglecting his son. It's that the son was neglecting dad. Do you see the brilliant twisting of truth such that the guilt is removed from dad and placed squarely on the son's head. When you accuse a wicked person of something, the wicked person will often accuse you back. Instead of looking at their own hearts and pondering what you have just said to them, the wicked will accuse you back. Wicked people display a persistent pattern of refusing to listen when you confront them with their sin or failure. Here's how it's, it says it in Proverbs 13, verse 1. Quite simply, it says, A wicked person does not listen to rebuke. If you confront a wicked person about something, he or she will find a way to take the spotlight off themselves and point it squarely on some sin or failure in you. Another example. A daughter says to her mother, Mom, when I was a girl, you leaned on me emotionally for a lot. You would talk to me all the time about your problems with dad. And I didn't want to know that stuff. I didn't want to be invited into your marriage problems. It was really uncomfortable for me. That's what the daughter says to her mother. And mom responds by saying, now listen to this. Oh, honey, I thought you wanted to know about my heart and feelings. When you were 13, you said that you wanted us to have a closer relationship, remember? You said that you wanted to be able to share more things together. So I started telling you more about what was going on with me. I was trying to be responsive to your request for us to be closer. Do you see the shift in the spotlight? Oh my gosh. The spotlight has been removed from mom's sin and failure, and it has been placed onto the daughter. Blame has been shifted. It's the daughter's fault for mom's inappropriate relationship with her. After all, the daughter asked for a closer relationship with mom. Do you see how the wicked mother subtly shifts the blame away from herself and puts the blame on her daughter? Now, in Jeremiah 6, and again in Jeremiah 8, God confronts the leaders of Israel by saying the following. God says, prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. Did you catch that? God is angry with the leaders of Israel because they dress the wounds of the people as though those wounds were not serious. Wicked people will dismiss your wounds. When you say, ouch, you hurt me, I was wounded by what you said or did. When you say that, wicked people will dress that wound as though it were not serious. They'll say some version of peace, peace, everything's fine, that's in the past, let bygones be bygones, forgive and forget, peace, peace. 
but there's no peace in your body and your heart and in the relationship. And then did you catch the last verse? Did you say, God says, are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. Right here, Jeremiah 6 and 8, God is naming the root problem of wicked people. They have no shame about how they wounded you. When you tell a wicked person how he or she has hurt you, uh, they will minimize your wound and treat it as though it were not serious. Then they will say some version of everything's fine, but everything's not fine. And they will feel no shame, for their hearts are hardened. Let me share another example. A daughter says to her mother, Mom, could we talk about some of the ways that I felt hurt by you when I was growing up? That's what the daughter says. Invites mom, asks mom, could we have a conversation about some of the ways that I felt hurt by you when I was growing up? Mom responds with, sure, honey, what horrible thing did I do now? And the daughter says, mom, I'm not saying you did anything horrible, but when I was a girl, you were always so contemptuous of me, criticizing me at nearly every turn. And mom replies, sweetheart, I really don't understand what you're referring to. Your father and I have always adored you. The conversation goes nowhere. And it ends quickly. A few days later, the daughter gets a text message from mom saying, Why were you being so critical of me the other day? If you continue to treat me with such cruelty, it will be hard for us to invite you to Christmas this year. We want to have a family that values togetherness and kindness. Let, let, let me read you the text again. And I made it up. This isn't real, but it's more than real. It's happened over and over so many times. Mom texts and says, why were you being so critical of me the other day? If you continue to treat me with such cruelty, it will be hard for us to invite you to Christmas this year. We want to have a family that values togetherness and kindness. Whoa. Whoa. What is happening? I'll tell you what's happening. The beginnings of being cast out of the family. It's the first signal of what is in store for the daughter. Mom's message is clear. If the daughter continues her efforts to expose mom's sin and failure, the daughter will not be included in the family Christmas gathering. But did you notice why the daughter is being excluded, potentially. What does mom appeal to? It's because the daughter is being critical of mom. But remember, this was the very thing that the daughter was confronting her mother about. The whole conversation began because the daughter named mom's tendency to be critical and contemptuous of her when she was growing up. Instead of mom taking an honest look at how she has been critical of her daughter, the daughter is being accused of criticizing mom. This is scapegoating. Mom is projecting her sin of criticism onto her daughter accusing her daughter of the very thing that she, mom, is in fact guilty of. And then, mom is threatening to cast daughter out of the family if daughter persists in naming mom's failure. Psalm 3820 summarizes this vignette quite well. It says, Those who repay my good with wickedness slander me when I pursue what is good. Those who repay my good with wickedness slander me when I pursue what is good. The Bible is so true about real life. The daughter offered mom a pearl. She offered her goodness. She told mom the truth. 
And that pearl is being repaid with slander. Look, if you continue to shine light on a wicked person's behavior, you will soon feel threatened. The wicked person will non-verbally communicate some version of, look, if you expose me, confront me, or don't totally align with me, I will make you pay in some way. I'm not saying they say that you know, explicitly, but that is the message that is communicated. The wicked person is saying, you have to choose me or you are done. The threat of casting you out is their weapon. A wicked person will emotionally abandon you or cast you out, whatever is within their power. If you insist on confronting the wicked person's behavior, if you refuse to sweep it under the rug and ignore it, the exclusion will come. The casting out will always come. It is the ever-present threat that undergirds the entire relationship. And, you know, just as an aside, by the way, in light of everything we know about attachment, do you see why being cast out feels like such a massive threat to your heart? We are attachment creatures. We are hardwired for connection. Nothing is more powerful than the threat of disownment by one's father or mother. Nothing is more powerful than the threat of being cast out of your family. Dan Allender puts it like this. He says, We all fear to some degree being cast out of another garden. He's making an allusion, of course, to the Garden of Eden. We all fear to some degree being cast out of another garden, be it a tightly knit family or an authoritarian church. Yet to defy a wicked person results in sure banishment. Let me say it again. Dan's words, we all fear to some degree being cast out of another garden, be it a tightly knit family or an authoritarian church. Yet to defy a wicked person results in sure banishment. Dan is affirming that if you confront a wicked person with the truth, they will begin the process of banishing you from the community, the family, the church. So in summary, one way you can spot wickedness is by looking for and noticing scapegoating behavior. Instead of looking at their own sin and failure, wicked people will turn the spotlight on you, accuse you of something, and if you persist in engaging with them, they will threaten to cast you out of the family or the community. Okay, that's scapegoating. Attribute number two that is often true of wicked people is intellectual deviousness. In other words, wicked people tend to be masterful at spinning words and twisting truth. Intellectual deviousness. The Psalms have great language for this ability. Psalm 55, verse 21 says this, His speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Wicked people are often highly skilled at being smooth with their words and twisting language to make them look good and to make you look, how shall I say it, to make you look foolish or to make you look silly for feeling hurt or to make you look unforgiving or divisive or unchristian in some way, or, you know, against unity. Wicked people cleverly use words to spin things so that they look righteous and good, and you look unrighteous and bad in some way. Their speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in their heart. Their words are more soothing than oil, 
yet those words are actually drawn swords. In the example I just shared about the text message from mom, did you notice how smooth her words were? Remember what she said? It will be hard for us to invite you to Christmas this year. We want to have a family that values togetherness and kindness. Those words, we want to have a family that values togetherness and kindness, they're more soothing than oil. But they are drawn swords. The sword, what's the sword? It's the implied accusation. Your critical nature, daughter, threatens our family values of togetherness and kindness. And mom's words harbor a threat. If you don't abandon your confrontation of me, we have no choice but to exclude you because in this family, we value togetherness and kindness. The, the, the words seem so harmless, but they're actually a threat. Th- that sentence, we want to have a family that values to get togetherness and kindness, it camouflages the accusation and the threat of expulsion so well. Who doesn't want a f- family that values togetherness and kindness? It sounds soothing like oil, but it's actually a drawn sword. And it is intended to land in your flesh as a warning of things to come. The writer of Psalm 56 is speaking about wicked people when he says this, All day long, they twist my words. They are always plotting to harm me. The wicked are very skilled at twisting your words. Think back to the earlier example of the daughter who confronts her mom about sharing too much with her, about inviting her into the marriage. What did mom say? Mom said, look, daughter, when you were 13, you asked for a a closer relationship. And that's why I started sharing more with you about my problems with your dad. I was just responding to the desire of your heart, sweetheart. Do you see how mom is twisting the daughter's words to place the fault on the daughter's head so that mom doesn't have to feel guilt. I mean, are you beginning to get a feel in your body for what it's like to try to talk to a wicked person about how they have hurt you? You may enter the conversation feeling clear in your head about what you want to say, but as the conversation unfolds, you start to feel confused. When you confront a wicked person about something, you will often feel confused during the conversation, and you will often feel confused after the conversation. Let me repeat it. When you confront a wicked person about something, you will often feel confused during the conversation while you're talking to them, and then... Again, later, as you're reflecting on the conversation, you will also often feel confused. If you try to talk to a wicked person about how they hurt you or about some aspect of their character that that is lacking in some way, you are going to leave that conversation feeling confused at best and outright crazy at worst. Why? Why? Because wicked people are usually quite skilled at spinning the truth to make them look good and to make you feel some measure of yuckiness or badness for having brought the subject up. A client recently described a conversation she had with her wicked father by saying, it was as if I suddenly lost my ability to think. That's how she described the conversation. That is not uncommon. When you engage with a wicked person, you will often lose the ability to think and you will leave the conversation feeling confused. Now, I am not saying that whatever comes out of a wicked person's mouth will be confusing. Oh, no. It's only when you broach the subject of some way that they have hurt you 
only when you suggest that they might have some failure or fault or character flaw. That's when the speech coming out of their mouth will confuse you. In other words, you will leave the conversation feeling spun around. You entered the conversation feeling clear about what you wanted to say and clear about the truth, the legitimacy of what you had to say. But by the time the conversation is over, your clarity is gone and it has been replaced by some measure of self-doubt. By the time the conversation is over, your clarity will have disappeared and it will be replaced by some measure of self-doubt. Maybe my mom's right. Maybe I am being too critical of her. Self-doubt. The Bible is full of language about being spun around by the words of wicked people. Psalm 64 puts it like this. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. Psalm 109, wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. Look, you've got to understand, wicked people are not dumb. Okay? They're not stupid. They are often quite skillful at twisting words and spinning you around with their words so that you begin to doubt yourself. One of the reasons that wicked people twist your words is to take the spotlight off their failure and place it on your failure. Dan Allender and Tremper Longman uh, wrote a book some years ago called Bold Love. And the last three chapters of Bold Love focus on how to address the three different categories of people that we've been discussing. And I want to read an excerpt from Bold Love that explains what drives wicked people. Here's how Allender and Longman put it. It's about a paragraph. They say, Wicked people routinely portray their motives and behavior as innocent. They are never the perpetrator of harm, but always the victim of it. They are very gifted in making the victim of their abuse feel like the perpetrator of it. If you expose the darkness of their behavior, you will be accused of being troubled, unreasonable, too sensitive, or even cruel. How could you think that about me? A wicked man will portray himself as the real victim. You simply misunderstand his intentions and then falsely accuse him. Because wicked people see themselves as the real victims, they feel justified in making you pay for what you have done to them. Oh, th that is such a great paragraph. Did you hear all the reversing and twisting? The wicked person is never the perpetrator of harm. They're the victim of it. How? Uh, the wicked person is the victim of your unreasonableness. It's not that dad failed to emotionally engage with you when you were younger. It's that you were unreasonable. You expected too much from him. You made it too hard for your dad to father you because you spent so much time playing guitar in your room. The wicked person is the victim of your hypersensitivity. It's not that mom displayed a pattern of icy contempt for you as a girl. It's that you were just too sensitive. You felt things too deeply, and therefore you blew her contempt out of proportion. And the wicked person is the victim of your cruelty. It's not that your parents harmed you. It's that you have misunderstood their well-intentioned hearts. And now, in your rush to judgment, you have falsely accused them. Look, uh, uh, I, I mean, this is making me sick to my stomach just speaking it. Wicked people are brilliant at using language to exonerate themselves and fill you with self-doubt and fill you with shame. Let me read. I'm going to read Allender and Longman's words again. Uh, just so you can sit with this paragraph. Wicked people routinely portray their motives and behavior as innocent. 
They're never the perpetrator of harm, but always the victim of it. They are very gifted in making the victim of their abuse feel like the perpetrator of it. If you expose the darkness of their behavior, you will be accused of being troubled, unreasonable, too sensitive, or even cruel. How could you think that about me? A wicked man will portray himself as the real victim. You simply misunderstand his intentions and then falsely accuse him. Because wicked people see themselves as the real victims, they feel justified in making you pay for what you have done to them. After a difficult conversation with a wicked person, you will often come away wondering if you are the one with the problem. Because the wicked are brilliant at diverting attention away from whatever issue you raised and focusing attention on something bad in you. Now, a final comment about wicked people. I hope I have demonstrated how wicked people use power to escape responsibility and to blame you. Wicked people are determined to have their own way, and they exert remarkable power in the manner in which they attempt to control others. However, however, this power may sometimes operate under a disguise of powerlessness or weakness. Remember, wickedness often involves deception. Sometimes, wicked people will trick you into believing that they are too weak, too lame, too clueless, too oblivious to actually exert power over you. Consider a mother who comes across as mild-mannered, unsophisticated, you know, not very smart, and her children, who are now grown adults, are all convinced that mom couldn't really help it when she did harm. Mom wasn't intentionally cruel. She was just kind of clueless about emotional things. And suppose you and I are talking about your mother, and I suggest that your mother pitted you against your father, that she set you up to be in a rivalry with your father. And your response is simply, Adam, you you don't understand. My mother wasn't sophisticated enough to pit my father against me. She wasn't a very smart woman. She certainly wasn't cunning or sophisticated. Uh, uh, oh, Oh, you have to realize how much wickedness relies on deception. The wicked deceive. If your mother is a wicked woman, the most effective disguise for her wickedness would be to make everyone think she is just a helpless, weak, frail, timid woman. Your father is the smart one, but mom's just not that smart. And so you and your siblings are convinced that mom is weak and fragile. As a result, when you consider the possibility of telling mom that she hurt you in a particular way, when you just in your imagination think about having the conversation with her, you immediately become afraid that mom will just dissolve into a puddle of tears. And through her tears, mom will say, I always knew you thought I was a terrible mother. I tried my best to love you kids, but I guess it just wasn't good enough. Now, what's happening here? Your mother is weaponizing her fragility. Weaponizing her fragility. You think of your mother as weak, but she is actually far more powerful than you realize. She is so powerful, in fact, that the possibility of her tears keep you from saying a simple sentence to her. The threat of her tears have silenced you for years, and you're not a timid person. 
You'll risk saying hard things to others, but not your mom. Why? Because she might fall to the floor and start sobbing. Do you not see how powerful this so-called fragile woman really is? The wicked cultivate and then weaponize their fragility. They use their tears as a weapon to keep you from speaking. The bottom line is that wicked people are essentially cowards. They are unwilling to look at the darkness of their own hearts. Dan Allender says it quite succinctly in Bold Love. He says it like this, Wicked people despise the cost of growth. The cost of growth is repentance. The cost of growth is you have to honestly look at your sin and failures and take responsibility for them. You must be willing, in other words, to feel the discomfort of guilt. Wicked people will not do this. And Allender continues by saying, wicked people hate anything that exposes the ugliness of their heart. Consequently, they are repelled by honestly facing life. I hope you are coming to realize that it is not always easy to spot a wicked person. You know, the temptation is to think, look, if I saw a wicked person, I'd know it. Don't be so sure about that. Wicked people rarely stand out as bad people. Here's how Scott Peck puts it in People of the Lie. I love this. This... This will get under your skin. The wick- Scott Peck says, The wicked are most ordinary. They live down the street. They may be rich or poor, educated or uneducated. There is little that is dramatic about them. They are not designated criminals. More often than not, they will be solid citizens, Sunday school teachers, policemen, or bankers and active in the PTA. I, boy, there it is. Wicked people do not stand out as bad people. They can be incredibly kind. They can be compassionate. They can have a servant's heart and support good godly causes. They can sing worship songs from the third row with uplifted hands. In fact, it is likely that a, a wicked person will treat you with kindness and compassion as long as you do not threaten their self-image by confronting them about their sin and failure. Remember, wickedness relies on deception. If you were a wicked person, just do this thought experiment with me. If you were a wicked person, what would be a good way to disguise yourself? What would be a good way to cover your wickedness so that others wouldn't see it? Would you join a satanic cult and wear a, wear a t-shirt that says, I'm a wicked person and I worship Satan? Or would you join a good church in your community? Indeed, wicked people are often found in churches and especially as leaders in churches. I'm not saying that every pastor is wicked. I'm not saying that every Christian ministry leader is wicked. I am saying that Christian leaders can be wicked people. Let me put it another way. Just because someone is a ministry leader in your church doesn't mean they aren't wicked. But don't take my word for it. Listen to Jeremiah and listen to Paul. Jeremiah puts it like this as he is praying to God. He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? You, God, are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. That's Jeremiah 12. Outwardly, the wicked often appear to be worshipers of God. He is always on their lips. Wicked people can be very kind have great doctrine, and sing worship songs every Sunday with their eyes closed. Paul puts it like this in 2 Corinthians 11. It's not just Jeremiah. Here's how Paul puts it. 
He says such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. What Paul and Jeremiah are saying is that wicked people disguise themselves by becoming, by becoming leaders in the church. Okay, before we end, let me briefly, ever so briefly, this is going to feel unsatisfying, but ever so briefly address the category of evil people, evil people. What is the difference between wickedness and evil? I first heard the following distinction from Dan Allender some years ago, and I have found it to be true. And here's what Dan says. He says, look, everything that's true of wicked people is also true of evil people. However, evil people add to this a commitment to humiliate and a commitment to destroy. A commitment to humiliate and a commitment to destroy. In other words, unlike wicked people, evil people are bent on your humiliation and they are bent on your destruction. Wicked people, they are content with being adored and obeyed. They don't feel a need to humiliate you and they don't feel a need to destroy you. Wicked people don't need to humiliate you as long as you remain loyal to them and you don't confront them about anything. Evil people, on the other hand, are not satisfied with your loyalty. They are not satisfied with being obeyed. They are not satisfied with controlling you. They also want to humiliate you and eventually destroy you. And as a result, evil people are very skilled in the use of mockery that is geared toward your humiliation. The mockery may be subtle. It may be infrequent. But if you are in relationship with an evil person, you will know the experience of being humiliated by their mockery. Okay, well done. You made it to the end of today's episode. We have now, in parts one and two, laid the groundwork that was necessary so that we can answer the question, how do I engage with someone who has harmed me? And that is what we will tackle in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening.